what I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the same. And right now, I feel like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders of P90X, Tony Horton, Baby Einstein, founder Julie Clark, um, Atari founder, and many, many more, and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Today's episode, I'm gonna, this is gonna be a little bit different episode actually today. Um, I had an amazing entrepreneur, and he actually invited me to interview him uh, for his podcast, and it was so good. I said, can you, please let me release this on mine. Um, and so it's going to be Craig Weiss, who's the co-founder of Retainer Club and Mouthguard Club. And he also talks about growing a company to a billion dollar valuation in three years and testifying in front of the U.S. Senate, raising $200 million, being featured in the Wall Street Journal, and much, much more. So uh, stay tuned. This is actually... Um, where I interviewed him for his podcast. Now, if you're an orthodontist or dentist or know someone, you'll definitely want to send this to them. And if you are not an orthodontist or dentist, it's still very valuable. Just you can skip through the uh, the sponsorship message because it does not apply to you. But um, today's episode is brought to you by um, Rise 25, which I co-founded with my business partner, John Corcoran. At Rise 25, we help B2B businesses connect their Dream 100 clients and referral partners, and we help you run your podcast so it generates ROI. Um, you know, as people have listened, if you've listened to this before, podcasting is much more personal to me, and it was inspired by my grandfather, who was a Holocaust survivor, and him and his brother were concentration camps in Nazi Germany, and were the only members to survive, but his legacy lives on because the Holocaust Foundation did an interview with him, which you can watch on my about page. So yes, podcasting will help your business. It's been the best thing for my business and my life in general, but it helps you and your guests leave a legacy. So if you have questions, um, I believe you know, any business should have a podcast. So if you have questions, you can email us support at rise25media.com or learn more, go to rise25.com. John and I made a video and we even left in the outtakes. So now check out today's episode. Craig Weiss here, the co-host of the In Your Face podcast, where we discuss stories of building a thriving business in today's competitive marketplace. I scaled up a consumer business to over a billion dollar valuation, and now with my friend and business partner, Dr. Blair Feldman, who was a practicing orthodontist for 20 years, we now help orthodontists grow their practice. Today, I have Jeremy Weiss here, who has done thousands of interviews with successful entrepreneurs, investors, and CEOs, and we flipped the script. Today, Jeremy's going to be the one interviewing me. Welcome to the show, Jeremy. Thank you, Craig. I appreciate it. And you know, you always say so casually, you know, growing a company to a billion dollar valuation. You know, we're going to dig into that today. And that's what I'm excited about. You know, growing a company to a billion dollar valuation in three years, testifying in front of the U.S. Senate and raising $200 million. And the, the Wall Street Journal interviewed you too. We're going to talk all about that. But um, before we do, this episode is brought to you by Mouthguard Club and Retainer Club. Both services help drive new patients, reactivations, and referrals to your orthodontic or dental office. Um, Mouthguard Club provides personalized custom mouthguards that are perfectly fitted for your teeth. Not to mention you can fully customize the design, even put your company, you know, team logo on it. It's one of the best fitting performing mouth guards available. You can go to mouthguardclub.com slash partner for more information. And Retainer Club is the easiest way for orthodontists to provide patients with perfectly fitting retainers at a great price. Oftentimes, or, you know, orthodontic offices don't even have a price point to meet what Retainer Club provides. And so, well, also they send you a steady stream of new patients in your office who are actively interested in getting treatments. And over a thousand patients already love Retainer Club. It's easy to use online services to order uh, and replace your retainers without take the key is without taking up your staff time. So orthodontists love Retainer Club because their long-term fans continue to refer new patients to their office. And plus, the smiles they are creating are actually being maintained. Um, so you can learn more, become a partner office to bring in more patients, make more money, go to retainerclub.com slash partner. So, you know, with this, Craig, we have a lot of stuff to cover with this billion dollar valuation. But I want to kind of start early on because you said earlier, I was slow on this entrepreneurial journey. Okay. And you have an unorthodox journey. So... 
talk a little bit about, and you, you even made the comment, unusual family background. So I need to hear for one, what, what that means. So, you know, I, I grew up in, I think, a very unique uh, situation in that uh, my, my mom, has, mom and dad uh, were married for 50 years. And <clears throat> my mom gave birth to children in the 1950s, 60s, 70s, and 80s. Um, and wow. she had, she had seven children across four decades and the, uh, on top, amazing woman. <clears throat> that sounds the, insane. Yeah. So, so on top of everything else, she was a federal judge for 25 years, probably the only female federal judge in the United States who had seven children. Um, and as one of my brothers used to joke, and would you believe it was all with the same father? Um, <laughs> and so, um, so, so you know, we had this weird family because the first five children were born in five years and three months with no twins. And then eight years later, me, and then eight years later, my little brother. So I had this strange upbringing in that the closest sibling to me in either direction was eight years, which, you know, it's all of high school and all of college. It's a, it's a big gap. So I had this weird kind of only child upbringing with six siblings. Um, so, um, and, and, you know, there's, there's this whole grouping of my five older siblings are between eight and 13 years older than me. <clears throat> and so, um, so, so it was unusual in a lot of different ways. Um, and, you know, I, I guest lecture at the, at, at WP Carey, the, the business school here at Arizona State University, the, the largest university in the United States. And when I sort of talk to them and I tell them my story, the irony is I'm, I'm, I'm guest lecturing in the, in the business school. So it's either uh, MBA students or exec MBA students, typically, sometimes the, the seniors taking entrepreneurship. And I, I usually start my story with uh, kindergarten. And so it's just kind of a fun place to start. And so I, I tell the story that uh, one of my good friends here in town is a board certified neurosurgeon. And um, his mom uh, over 40 years ago was my preschool teacher when I was in you know, preschool and kindergarten. And so he once said to me, you know, Craig, I grew up on stories about you in my home. And I said, well, I, I said, what do you mean you grew up with stories about me? Like that, that doesn't make any sense. Why, why would your mom be telling stories about some kid in her kindergarten class? Like what, what, what story could there be to tell? And he said, oh, well, she would tell me, you know, it's so interesting. Like all these little kids in my class, you know, when it comes time for lunch, they take out their little brown paper bags and, you know, they'd have their little PB and J's with a crust cut off and their little baggie with, you know, carrot sticks. But there's this one little boy and he's got like a can of Coke and a chocolate chip cookie. <laughs> and, and so she said, she's like, he's like a total free agent, you know? And, and like all the other kids are like, how do I get on this program? Um, and so, when I, I tell the story, I, I say, look, I was the sixth of seven children. You were packing your lunch? What was going on? Yeah, cl yeah, clearly my parents had given up on child raising at this point. <laughs> and, and I must have been packing my own lunch. Um, and so, you know, back in kindergarten. And so I sort of say, look, I, from an early age, I obviously was, you know, trying to figure things out on my own. Um, <clears throat> I do remember, um, I do remember when I actually genuinely try to think back to my first kind of entrepreneurial moment. Um, I do remember it actually. I was in elementary school and I was, you know, like, like a lot of little boys at the time had baseball cards and was into baseball cards. And I remember um, reading about like the, the most valuable baseball card at the time, not like historically, but like during my, you know, like the card that would, would have been con, sort of contemporaneous. Most coveted time, yeah. you know, card during your time. Yeah, yeah. It was the, was the Don Mattingly 1984 Don Ross baseball card. And it, and it was like $100. And I remember that when the card first came out, it was like a penny and you, you could buy them for a penny and now it was worth a hundred dollars. And I sort of did the math in my head and I'm like, wait a second, that means this thing went up, you know, a hundred times a hundred, right? It was like a 10,000, you know, percent increase in price. And I was like, well, so <clears throat> there's a lot of money to be made. I mean, if I'd bought all those Don Mattingly cards at a penny, like, you know, wow, I could make so much money. And so what, what if I could predict what's the next card that's, that's now worth not that much, but that could be worth a fortune. And I did all this kind of research and I came to the conclusion that there was this one card um, and it was the, the Bo Jackson rookie baseball card. You know, here's a two sports star and the, 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 the card that came out was this 1986, you know, tops, 
um, card that was um, part of their extended rookie cards. So there weren't that many of them. And I went to my dad with this idea that I could get them for, you know, a dollar, two dollars, and I thought they'd be worth a lot of money. And my dad, you know, just totally supported the uh, the whole idea, the strategy, everything. And we he would come with me to baseball card shows and we'd start buying them up. And I remember, you know, I bought a thousand of these cards. Wow. And, um, you know, spending, you know, call it, you know, a couple of thousand dollars with a thought, hey, if these things go up to a hundred dollars or more, you know, there's some real money here. And then uh, for those of, for, for those who remember, you know, he, he had this devastating career ending, you know, injury, this super freak injury. And he went from this incredible two sports star to, you know, that was it. He was, he was kind of done. And, uh, and my investment in essence kind of went down the drain. And, and my dad was just, you know, never for a second made me feel bad that, you know, it was sort of a bad investment or that it didn't work out. I think he was just totally supportive that I had this idea and a strategy and, Hey, you know, you can't control all the outcomes, but you know, that, that he, he was so supportive of it. So I think that was sort of, for me, my first mm. sort of taste of being an entrepreneur. But, but after that, I'm surprised I, you didn't just, <clears throat> just dominate the stock market with that mindset. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, it is funny because I, I do, it's funny you bring up the stock market because there's, there's a few stock market stories in terms of my, uh, my, my development, both uh, as an entrepreneur and just personally. So if we remember, we'll circle back to them. But what did I, your uh, dad do, Craig? So my dad was a patent attorney. Uh, mm -hmm. He was the youngest ever managing patent attorney at IBM, uh, which is, I was born in Poughkeepsie, New York. And then he moved out to Phoenix in the 1970s when I was literally six months old mm -hmm. uh, to become the uh, general patent attorney for Motorola. And so, uh, so I grew up in Phoenix as a, as a result of, of, you know, that big move. And so he, and then about a little more than 40 years ago, my father founded his own IP firm here in Arizona. Uh, the four oldest sons. So the first, so it, of the seven kids, the first two were girls, the next five were boys. So um, my sister Gail is a funny story. Uh, <laughs> she also is a little bit of a late bloomer. She finished uh, last in her class in high school. Um, and, and then ended up going to college to this small college in Ohio where she became the first person in the 150 year history of the college to triple major. Um, and wow. then she went to Yale and got a PhD in philosophy and she's now a professor at uh, George Washington university. Um, and then my sister Felicia has a PhD in, in clinical psychology. And then, uh, so then there's my, my next bro set of brothers, um, uh, the, the, my three older brothers are all IP attorneys. Um, and, and I, and, and I started off also, uh, as an IP attorney, I became a oh. patent attorney like my father and the four boys who were all IP attorneys all ended up working for my father at, at, at the family firm. And wow. So, um, but, but what was funny about that was, uh, to be a patent attorney, you have to have a bachelor's of science degree. Uh, to qualify in order to take the patent bar. And so, so I was a philosophy major in college. And so I had literally not a single credit towards a bachelor's of science degree. And so after law school, I literally had to go back to school uh, to take the equivalent of a bachelor's of science degree, uh, mm -hmm. in, my, in my case, in biology and chemistry. Um, so I, I did that. Um, and I, Why I, philosophy? So... I grew yeah, up. Yeah, I mean, you I, went to Penn. And you're like, oh, I'm going to major in philosophy. So you know, it's funny. I I was always interested in philosophy. I was reading books all throughout high school. Uh, I loved Marcus Aurelius' uh, Meditations on First Philosophy. Uh, fascinating sort of Stoic philosopher. Um, I just I don't know. I was always kind of fascinated by um, the way sort of taking a step back and ha how to actually how do how do how do things work how do people interact why do what what motivates people to do what they do how how does society kind of get structured uh and in some ways law was was um an extension of that curiosity um i remember my first year of law school sort of it felt like i was putting on a different set of glasses like okay so you know we all have to interact but there have to be sort of rules that govern how we interact um and then if you break those rules, there have to be consequences. And so it came in handy. It came in handy. I've actually, I've often felt that the philosophy um, studies have come in handy in, in many aspects of my life in terms of just, it, it, it helps you learn how to think. Um, and of course, you have to do a lot of writing, a lot of reading and a lot of writing. And those are good skills to hone as well. 
So, um, so why yeah. then law? You went on to, to law school. So, you know, the funny thing about being Your a lawyer- Your dad offered you a job. Yeah. Right? <laughs> you know, it's funny, right? I mean, there's a, there's a great, you know, the Nobel Prize winning, um, he's, a, he's a psychologist, but he got the Nobel Prize in economics is, is Daniel Kahneman. Mm. Um, and he- Prolific, yeah. He, a lot of amazing books he's written too. Yeah, yeah. So really interesting guy. And he has this, in his, yeah, he's got a book called, I think, Thinking Fast and Slow. Yeah, it's really um, long really long and, and yeah. tedious book to get through, like really important, but not super well written. Um, and, and he has this sort of, I can't remember if it's in that book or in the, or in the better book, which is the undoing project, which is Michael Lewis's book about Daniel Kahneman. Um, but it, the best stuff is like the books that, that use his research. Like I think Dan totally. Ariely has on probably Michael Lewis had, there's a bunch of really good ones that use his research. Yes. Totally. So, so in one of those books, he sort of has this theory that I think is so true, which is that you often can't learn very much about the most important choices people make in their life. You actually can learn a lot more about them by much smaller choices. So for example, you know, what they end up doing for a living might be just kind of what their parents did for a living, which was kind of my story. I became a patent attorney. My dad was a patent attorney. Like he had his own firm. Like I, I probably didn't think about it as much as I should have. Um, and you know, who you marry is often like who sat next to you, you know, that day in school. Right. Like, and, um, and so whereas, you know, what, what, you know, what kind of law you practice or, you know, other things might be, you know, more specific, uh, that, that, that are, are more telling. So in my case, you know, my mom was a lawyer. She was a judge. My dad was a lawyer. I was always argumentative as a kid. So people kept telling me I should be a lawyer. <laughs> um, and so, so I, you know, for a decade, I was a patent attorney and, you know, providing legal services to clients. And I met entrepreneurs every day. You know, those were my clients. They'd come in with new ideas and they were generally, you know, excited, exciting people to talk to. They, they came into my office, they were full of energy, they were pumped up. You know, we were usually one of the first people they met with at the beginning of their entrepreneurial journey. So they were still upbeat and enthusiastic and hadn't yet been kind of beaten down by life. And um, so it was, you know, really positive. And, and, and so, but I, I noticed a few things. One was... I wasn't super happy. Like I, you know, I, I couldn't quite put my finger on it, but I, I didn't feel entirely fulfilled professionally. And, um, I don't, I don't, you know, I don't know that I knew why, but I just felt a little bit like, you know, it was the grind, you know, you, you know, you have to make a living. So this is my you know path and I'm going to go to work and draft patent applications and, you know, try to get patents for my clients. But I, it didn't, it didn't really just get me super pumped up every morning to, you know, race into the office. And so, <clears throat> so I had this, you know, interesting thing. My, my wife and I um, moved to Israel. Um, and so we actually, we met on junior of college abroad in Israel and, and, and she's actually a rabbi. So she had to go back to rabbinical school. So we, I took a year off between college and law school. We lived for a year in, in Jerusalem. And then we ended up moving there for two more years, uh, between 2000 and 2002. And it was during that time that I met this guy, uh, another American who, would, who was living in Israel, uh, this guy, Ellie. And, and for like the first almost 10 years of our uh, friendship, we were just friends and we, we you know, got to know each other and, on, and hung out. And, and eventually when Eric and I returned to the United States, I stayed in touch with Ellie. Uh, which, you know, wasn't super convenient to do. This was kind of at the beginning of, uh, you know, of, of internet and, and cell There's phones. also a big time difference too. Yeah, big time difference. But we stayed in touch. And when he would come to America, which he did quite frequently, you know, he would try to swing by Arizona and we would, we would hang out or I'd come visit him in, in other places that he was in Colorado or in other places. And he was a guy that I kind of knew early on. Uh, was a serious entrepreneur. He had taken three companies from founding to IPO in his 20s, which is wow. sort of, you know, kind of amazing. And at the time that I met him, uh, he was a venture capitalist and eventually became one of the 10 partners at, at, at Benchmark, which was a, the VC fund behind Twitter and eBay. And so- You better really, have him on the podcast, by the way. Yeah, so for sure. Um, so, so about sort of 10 years into my, you know, friendship with Ellie, um, uh, there was this transition where he he went from from fen, friend to, to mentor, and and it happened around this uh, the the company that I ended up uh, sort of making my name with. So um, because 
it was our own law firm. And because we kind of were meeting with entrepreneurs all the time, we, we were, you know, a little entrepreneurial our, our, ourselves. And so in 2005, um, my, my brother, Mark, who's also a patent attorney, went to uh, China for a client of our law firms. And he saw a crude version of an electronic cigar. And he thought, you know, this would make a great product, you know, if ever somehow they could get it down to the size of like a, an actual cigarette. And so he founded this company called Enjoy as a venture of our law firms in late 2006. So on day one, I became, you know, a shareholder, but I, I wasn't really involved with the company. Um, and my brother, Mark, for his part, you know, was also an IP attorney like me. And so he brought in some friends of his to, who were more business operator types to, to run the company. And so uh, the company, you know, starts off kind of strong. They do 300 grand of revenue in 07. They do 3 million in 08. They do wow. 7 million in 09. They're really starting to grow. And then a, a couple of sort of few terrible things happened. Um, so in 2008, my, my father passed away, which was, mm. you know, really, really devastating. Yeah, no, I appreciate it. It was really devastating, you know, to my whole family. He was, you know, a beloved guy. Um, I had a really close relationship with my dad. And, um, but also he was, you know, the, the, the head of the firm. He was the rainmaker. He probably brought in 40% of the clients. And so there was kind of a horrifying realization uh, for me in particular. You know, I was gosh, 34 years old. And I had a 15 month old son at the time. And um, I just had that feeling of I'm up on the tightrope. And you know, the net's just been pulled out, you know, from under me, like, you know, uh, my dad was one of those guys that if you know, he was always going to be there for you, he was always going to make sure you, you didn't fall. And, mm. but you know, he, he, he was always going to be there for you until he wasn't there for you, right? Because he couldn't be. And so, um, so it was just really terrifying. And I just remember that feeling of fear. And so, so that happens. And as I'm kind of starting to uh, recover from that, I start to focus on, well, well, wait a second. I mean, who's going to replace all of this revenue that my dad's generating from the law firm? Like the, this firm could go under, you know, what, what, so I start, um, reading a bunch of business books and I start joining like, you know, kind of CEO organizations and, and tr just thinking of the law firm as a business, right? How do I grow this business and keep this business healthy? And so meanwhile, this, this, this enjoy thing on the side is, is starting to kind of percolate. And, and so it sounds more like percolate. Yeah, no, it, it was definitely very, it, but it was, off. it was really taking off, but in some respects, like, you know, all the more reason why there was nothing for me to do. Like, it, like kind of like, Hey, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Like clearly these people know what they're doing. The company's taking off. I have all these shares, you know, that might solve all of our financial problems. And so, and, I, and, and better yet, I don't even have to do anything, you know, to, to make that happen. And so, uh, so, so, so the, the, the first thing that happened was before my father passed away, um, our youngest brother uh, was at the time a day trader. And I used to joke that, that day traders don't really care if stocks go up or down as, as long as they respond violently. And, and so, you know, he, he's the one who kind of started to say, wait a second, you know, these really volatile stocks, some of them are, are really moving up and down because the companies are involved in like, you know, bet the company patent litigation. And like, you know, well, wait a second, my brothers are patent attorneys. If they could like read the briefs and go to court and tell me who was going to win and I know which way to bet, you know, I could make a fortune. And so um, he, he comes to you know, us with this idea. And so you know, when I went to the University of Pennsylvania, I was studying philosophy in the College of Arts and Sciences, but I had a bunch of friends who were at Wharton you know, getting business degrees. And so I went yeah, to- One of the top schools in the country. Yeah. yeah so, so, so one of my good friends that, I, that I'm still in touch with, I went to and, and, he, and he was running a hedge fund. And I said, hey, Adam, you know, what do you think of my brother's idea? And he goes, oh, I think it's a great idea. You, know, you, should, you should do a hedge fund with that. And I said, well, what do you mean do a hedge fund? You know, I'm the philosophy guy. And, uh, and he's like, no, 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 it's not, it's not that complicated. And he walked me through kind of the economics and here's how you'd get it set it up. And this is the lawyers I would recommend you use. And this is the brokerage firm. And, and so I said, well, would you help? Would you, you know, help us? Would you be a partner? And he said, sure. So we, we, we start this hedge fund, um, you know, in essence on the side of the law practice because it wasn't, didn't require a full-time uh, attention because these, these occurrences were not that frequent. 
And so, but it taught me some valuable lessons. I learned about doing something outside of the practice of law, even though it was, you know, tangential to law. Um, I also learned how, you know, kind of have, have, have how to make very quick decisions with imperfect information and risk management and, um, and also a little bit of fundraising. I had to raise some money. And Adam basically said, look, the only way to really make money in a hedge fund is to have institutional investment, people who can write really large checks. And the only way to get institutional investors is to have a track record that you can point to. And the only way to have a track record is to have a track record. So basically, you just got to raise from anybody just to get started, and then you can build your track record. So <laughs> that's, a, that's advice, a life yeah. to live by. In order yeah. to get a track record, you need a track record or whatever. Exactly. Yeah. It was like a catch-22. So I, I started raising money, and I, only, I raised not a lot of money, like maybe 1.8 million bucks. And you know, mostly family and friends. And so a large chunk of money for not raising yeah, money. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so, you know, we had a nice compelling story to tell and we started making money doing this hedge fund thing. And so, um, so it's just kind of a fun thing on the side. So, so anyhow, so my, my father passes away, I'm joining these CEO groups, I'm reading these books. And then, and then on the Enjoy side, two terrible things happened. One, one was the FDA directed U.S. Customs to see shipments of Enjoy's products as unapproved drug delivery devices, and and around the same time, my brother had a falling out with these friends of his he'd brought in to run the company. So it was just really kind of a terrible kind of double whammy. And so Ellie, my my friend, you know, who's turning into my mentor, says, you know, Craig, this electronic cigarette thing seems to be kind of you know, a new trend that's taking off, you know, your family founded this company, like kind of how come you're not more involved in this? And he was the first person to kind of plant that seed. And so um, I continue to kind of, you know, learn more about it and read more. And, um, and Ellie starts to encourage me to take, you know, a more active role. And I ask him to, uh, you know, well, if, if, if we're able to, retake kind of control over the company from the people that, that my brother brought in, you know, would you become my chairman of the board? Would you, you know, would you take an active role? And he agreed to do that. Um, and so it's a longer story for perhaps another podcast, but, but the, the takeover story is its own crazy story because we'd given away so many shares that we'd actually lost control over the company. And, and so it was literally like a hostile takeover. It's probably more common than people think in, in, in across the board. Yeah, no, I always talk to people about this uh, when I talk to other uh, business school students or other people, other younger entrepreneurs about making sure you maintain control. Um, and so- How do you so, navigate a hostile takeover? <laughs> it's a crazy story. Literally, a, 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 I don't want to go too off topic, but let's just say that, um, that uh, there were there uh, on June fourth, two thousand and ten. There were two groups of shareholders at the annual shareholder meeting. Each group had fifty one percent of the vote, um, and and but I had a later dated fifty one percent than the other group, and so I had a uh, an off duty police officer with a gun and a badge for forty seven dollars an hour on standby in case people <laughs> like you know went crazy, um, and and two teams of sort of computer forensic specialists ready to seize laptops and clone hard drives and. Uh, it was really like a scene out of a movie, uh, but we we retook control over the company at this at this sort of crazy uh, uh, annual shareholder meeting. Um, and then, um, you know, Ellie gave me a, a speech that was when I think back, and it's a story I always tell when I talk to the business school students at, at ASU. When I think back to like, you know, was there a moment back that one moment where you became an entrepreneur, this was the moment. Um, he was visiting me in Arizona. We were, I took him on a drive up north to some, you know, a couple of hours away where there's some really nice hiking and some great sights to see. And we we stop in this tiny little artist colony town up in the mountains uh, of Arizona. And there's a little coffee shop there. And so we sit down and he looks at me and, and he says, so do you want me to give you the secret to life? And I'm like, who says no to that? You know, yeah, bring it. Let me hear the secret to life. And so he kind of crouches down to like almost like pretend like, you know, he doesn't want other, anyone else to hear. And he sort of motions to, to the other people in the room. And he says, so you see all these people over here? He goes, they have the same inventory of hours each day as you and me. He said, the difference between me and them is they're selling their time for money. 
and you see that guy and he points to the barista, you know, behind the counter, he goes, you know, he's selling his for, you know, five bucks an hour. And he goes, look, Craig, you're a smart guy. You're, you're a patent attorney. You know, maybe you can sell yours for, you know, a couple of hundred bucks an hour. But at the end of the day, there's only so many hours in the day. And if you're selling it for money, there's only so much money you can make. But as an entrepreneur, you can leverage your time in an exponential way uh, to make money that's not sort of correlated to, you know, your hourly rate. And there was just a certain beauty to that logic. And uh, it was really powerful to me. And I just was like, it clicked. And I was like, that's, that sounds good. That's for me. Um, so with his encouragement um, and this crazy hostile takeover, um, you know, I become the president of this company that really I have almost zero background or knowledge in. And, I, and, and I, one of my favorite things I love saying to the business school students is there's not a single person in this room who knew less about business than I knew <laughs> you know, when I sort of became responsible for this company, um, you know, it was manufacturing, it was product development, it was, um, you know, R&D, it was regulatory, it was sales and marketing, it was distribution. I mean, things that I didn't know anything about and had no experience in. And uh, so I did, in essence, what my brother did. I brought someone else in who had a lot of those skills to run the company. But over the next six months, I, I started to see like, was I didn't quite feel like that person, you know, entirely was making what I thought were the right decisions. And I, I didn't understand some of their decisions. And, and, uh, and, and Ellie kind of kept encouraging me, encouraging me. And then he was the first person to say, Craig, maybe you should be the one running the company. And uh, at first, that just seemed insane to me. Like I'd been providing legal services to clients for 10 years. Like, what, what do I know about all of those things? But he was very supportive and was like, you know, you're a smart guy, you'll figure it out. And, um, and so um, I leaned heavily on him and called him every day, probably for the better part of one to two years um, with questions, you know, hey, I got this situation, I got that situation. What do you think about this? What do you think about that? I kept reading books. I kept going to my CEO groups. And the crazy thing is when I, when I took over the controller, we had eight employees and the controller said we'd be out of cash in two weeks. And we were locked in this kind of death struggle with the FDA. And, um, and ultimately, um, you know, I mean, it's funny. I remember we had to use our vendors as our line of credit. You know, we couldn't pay our vendors until we got paid from our customers. And it was just sort of this giant, you know, game of, of borrowing from Peter to pay Paul. Um, but we, you know, I, I, I brought, I was very fortunate. I was able to hire some really smart people. Um, I had, you know, Ellie's tremendous mentorship and uh, we defeated. So the, the crazy thing is we, <laughs> Uh, we defeated the FDA in federal court. It's probably the thing I'm most proud of wow. is that uh, we, we it, you know, we, uh, uh, you know, I ended up meeting with FDA four times and, and the MHRA in the UK, they're the FDA equivalent twice and Health Canada twice. Um, but we really created a, uh, the regulatory framework for a whole new category to exist. Um, in this interesting field that's become kind of controversial, this electronic nicotine delivery field, um, I can say for, from my perspective, I was so totally focused on the fact that you had, like basically at the time I started at Enjoy, um, the smoking rate in the United States had actually been increasing in 2008 and 2009. And in 2010, over 20% of the adults in the United States were smokers, uh, over 40 million Americans. And the World Health Organization had come out and said, you know, over a billion human beings were going to die this century from smoking. And I thought, you know, this is nuts. I mean, nicotine's not carcinogenic. Nicotine's an FDA-approved drug in the patch and the gum. It's, it's the delivery system that's, that's toxic and carcinogenic. You're smoking it into your lungs. Yeah, you're burning this organic material and you're lighting this stuff on fire and you're breathing all this horrible, you know, crap into your lungs. And I thought, well, wait a second, if we can you know, create technology to give the, the over 1.3 billion people on the planet who are already addicted to nicotine, you know, the same nicotine that they crave, but in a non-toxic delivery system. I was like, this is like the greatest public health opportunity of the century. I mean, you have almost 500,000 Americans dying every year from tobacco related illness. Um, and so it's a, it's a huge number. It's over a thousand a day, right? So, um, so I got kind of obsessed with that idea of we're, we're, you know, we're a public health company. We're a biotech company. We're, you know, we're basically going to save more lives than Pfizer. And so um, I, with, with that kind of 
the power of that, you know, sort of technology and argument, I was able to recruit the 17th Surgeon General of the United States to serve on our board of directors. And my chief scientist, you know, had an MD, PhD from Stanford and was a full tenured professor of biochemistry at Princeton and was on the stand up to cancer team. And, you know, my chief of regulatory came from Johnson and Johnson and was the head of their global efforts of, you know, uh, eradicating tobacco use. So you put an um, amazing team together. Yeah, no, it was just an amazing, amazing team. And, you know, kind of, Little by little, you know, we, well, you know, it wasn't so little by little, we, in a really fast way, we grew tremendously. And so, um, so yeah, so I, I ended up uh, getting my first private equity investment uh, in 2011, uh, and we raised uh, $30 million at, a, at an $80 million uh, pre-money valuation. Um, and that was like, oh, wow, like, this is now, like, we're a real company. and and then. We grew and grew and grew, and then raised seventy-five million dollars from uh, a group that included Sean Parker and Fidelity um, at a four hundred and twenty-five million dollar valuation, and then grew and grew and grew, and then a year later raised seventy-four million dollars at a billion-dollar valuation from uh, Fidelity, Morgan Stanley, and and, and a, a group uh, part of Bain Capital. So it was this three and a half year kind of insane rocket ship, um, and. Uh, it was it was a wild time. It was an exciting time. Uh, we ended up uh, manufacturing 80 million units of of products that uh, that we distributed in about 130,000 retail locations all around the world. Uh, I ended up, you know, with offices in three continents. We had you know 130 employees. Um, and the thing I'm most proud of is. You know, not only when I left Enjoy in, in 2000, I, I, I went from CEO to chairman uh, in 2014 and, and cycled off the board in 2015, you know, the smoking rate was under 14% in the United States, uh, which was a, a, such a precipitous decline. It was totally unfathomable to public health that the smoking rate could drop that. Again, it was going up, you know, in 2008, 2009. So for it to drop that much was totally shocking. And I was excited that we were using technology, which is what I think great American companies do uh, to solve what had been previously thought to be just kind of an unsolvable problem. And, um, you know, I still have people come up to me today, like, oh my God, you know, I, I was a pack a day smoker for 20 years and I tried the patch and I tried the gum and nothing worked and I used your product to quit smoking. Like, thank you for saving my mm. life. Um, That's powerful. Yeah. And so, you know, of course, in the last couple of years, um, you know, uh, there's been a lot of, to, you know, sort of publicity about youth access, uh, uh, and, and it, 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 you know, fortunately is not about our company, you know, my, my company's products, but, 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 you know, one of our competitors, but what I would say is, um, you know, that's part of why I'm no longer at Enjoy was that in 2014, you know, right when those people came in the last group of institutional investors, it was really at a time when consumer, um, the, 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 the consumer, market was changing uh and from our product which looked exactly like a cigarette to products that looked nothing like a cigarette um and that consumer preference uh to a different form factor really you know caused us to our company to to you know miss our numbers and at the end of the day when you're the ceo the buck stops with you and so the new investors were uh, wanting a, uh, one of their, you know, a CEO of their choosing to come in. And so I, I was, you know, politely asked to step aside, which I did. And um, so that was, you know, for me, uh, a bummer, you know, I, I, I had no sooner been congratulated for, you know, creating a unicorn, a privately held, you know, company with a billion dollar valuation than I was sort of, you know, sort of shown the door. So that was a good life lesson for me. Um, and f fortunately, I, I had not, allowed the success of Enjoy to kind of infect my personality or become too closely identified with who I was as a person. Uh, and it was helpful to have a very down to earth wife who never let my head get too big. Um, and so when I, when it went away, it was a bummer, but it wasn't like the loss of an identity, uh, for me. So, um, but, but yeah, so it was this wild ride. I mean, during the heyday, I was speaking at conferences. I was getting interviewed. I was on television almost every week with, you know, CNN and Fox and, and MSNBC and CNBC and, you know, uh, front page of the Wall Street Journal and, and the front page of the business section of the New York Times. And in just, you know, one thing after another, it was a, just a total wild, you know, wild, wild ride.
Your wife would have to deflate your head on a daily basis. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. She's about the least materialistic person I've ever met. So um, she really could care less about, you know, all of those successes. Yeah. Like, Craig, um, yeah, I know you're on the front page. Go to the dishes. I don't, I don't well, it's funny, you know, we, the, I mentioned that the board certified neurosurgeon that I'm friends with. So he married like his high school sweetheart and, and his wife, you know, of course, knew him before he became a board certified neurosurgeon. And she's like the most lovely down to earth person ever. And, and she used to tell a story to my wife and I that my wife absolutely loved, which is that she'll still say to her husband, you know, hey, Dan, I know it's not brain surgery, but can you take out the garbage? <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, there's, there's definitely something that, um, uh, yeah, that we gravitated towards. That's amazing. Uh, thanks for sharing that story. Uh, take me up to present day. So how did you meet Blair? And so I want to talk about how this idea came about with Mouth Guard Club, Retainer Club. So, you know, Blair and I have known each other for almost 20 years. He he moved from Chicago to Phoenix uh, uh, early 2000s. Um, we met through our wives, actually. And my wife met his wife, who's actually all, she, uh, Blair's wife's also a dentist. And so, uh, so she's my dentist and he's my orthodontist. Um, but, but we met through mm. our, through our wives and Blair and I just really hit it off. And I, I used to joke with Blair that he, he was an entrepreneur trapped in the body of an orthodontist. Um, you know, he, he had these tremendous entrepreneurial instincts and, and then he started a business on the side and he tried another business on the side and he, <coughs> excuse me, he was always kind of had that, you know, he was an early adopter of technology. He was always kind of on the cutting edge. And I really tried to encourage that. I, I had him join one of my CEO groups and, um, and I just thought it was remarkable for someone that, that was in a profession that, you know, isn't isn't entirely known for its entrepreneurship to, to embrace entrepreneurship. And so we became really good friends and about, uh, gosh, you know, uh, maybe, uh, three or four years ago, he came to me with this idea and it was sort of just as I was transitioning out of enjoy, but he said, look, you know, I want to have, have this idea. I want to run by you. And he, he had a front row seat for this crazy, you know, rocket ship, uh, enjoy ride. And so he said, you know, the standard of care in orthodonture is, you know, when you have either braces or Invisalign, you're done with treatment. You're supposed to wear a retainer when you sleep at night for the rest of your life. And um, if you don't, your teeth are going to move. And of course, anybody who's, you know, kind of the age that Blair and I are in uh, knows this to be true because we probably had braces like me when I was a kid and we didn't wear a retainer and our teeth moved. And, and I ended up having to go back to Blair for, you know, Invisalign treatment as an adult. And so... He said, look, no one really wears the retainer forever because eventually the thing gets gross or you break it or you lose it or the dog eats it. And the process of getting it replaced is just kind of a nightmare. It's just a big bag of hurt. You got to either track down your original orthodontist or find a new one. And you have to do these horrible impressions where there's goo and you're gagging on it. And, you know, it's multiple appointments and it's hundreds and hundreds of dollars. And, and so people just don't do it. They just blow it off. And so he said, look, my idea is basically like Dollar Shave Club for retainers, you know, retainer club. So brand new retainer shows up in the mail once a year, 99 bucks, throw away the old one, you know, pop in the new one. I'm like, wow, I think that's a great idea. And he's like, yeah, you know, there's really no kind of subscription, you know, model in the whole field of orthodontry. And so I said, okay, well, so like, how does it work? You know, I mean, and so he walks me through this kind of fascinating sort of process that you know, there, there's a couple of key pieces of technology that, that are relatively new, not brand new, but, you know, like last 10 years, you know, kind of new that have made this possible. One is uh, what's replaced the goo is this 3D scanner. And there's various tech companies that, that make this technology, but, you know, it's, it's, it's in the 20 to $30,000 range for one of these 3D scanners. And it's just a high, you know, high grade set of, you know, sort of cameras that take these pictures of your teeth that are super accurate. And what I learned sort of getting all this information from Blair is that uh, the, you know, the accuracy of that, of the alginate impressions that are taken with the goo is it's, there's a lot of error 
uh, with that, which is some, something that this, the do-it-yourself orthodontic companies are discovering as they mail people kits. And there's a high error rate. Um, they're not entirely accurate. They, they're dependent on humidity and, and, and how long you're keeping it in, how easily you're taking it out. Whereas the scanners are like perfect. They're just, they kind of almost can't make a mistake. They're so, technology is so amazing and, and hyper accurate. So, um, so those scanners are now, whereas Blair was an early adopter, maybe 10 years ago today, um, you know, the majority of orthodontists in the United States have a 3d scanner and, and, you know, tens of thousands of dentists have them too. So that was sort of the, one of the key pieces of technology and the other was 3d printing. So again, you know, 3d printing has been around for a while, but not in a low cost enough way. And so, you know, Blair walks me through, you know, you, you, you take a scan and we become a, you know, we're a drop down menu on, on the scanner. And so we literally would get the scan in real time from anyone in the world. Um, and then we can 3d print a mold and then make these retainers. Um, and, and eventually Blair said, look, the, you can use the exact same technology more or less for making mouth guards, custom mouth guards for, for people who play sports. And so, the more I learned about all of this, uh, the more I thought there was just this amazing opportunity because um, I thought, you know, first of all, we're not trying to create a new behavior that doesn't exist, right? Everybody wears their retainer, you know, the first night after they get their braces off or, you know, when they complete treatment. Um, the, the problem isn't, you know, getting them to start, it's, it's getting them to continue because not only does the thing get gross or they break it or they lose it, but there's sort of no one left to manage compliance in the system because they're, you know, unlike dentists, people only have a two year relationship with their orthodontist and then that's it. They kind of never see them again. And so, um, so we, 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 you know, we talk about it and I, I sort of say, you know, start giving Blair some ideas that are just kind of coming to me like, oh, you know, what you should do is you should partner with orthodontists around the country and offer this service to them. And, you know, basically they probably don't even want to be in the retainer business. They'd rather spend all their time actually treating patients. And, uh, and Blair told me a story that, that really reinforced that, which was, he said, look, I only have a two-year relationship, unlike the dentist who might get a lifetime relationship, but it's a great two-year relationship. It, it kind of, you know, starts maybe uh, with people's, you know, not happy with their smile. And then, you know, over these two years, we're, we're giving them an amazing smile and it ends, if anything, on a high note. And he goes, it's a great, great relationship. And he goes, 95% of the time, I never see them again. <clears throat> but he said, unfortunately, in the 5% of the time that I do see them again, it's not a great relationship. Um, what ends up happening is they they, uh, they're unhappy, they're, they're, their teeth have moved, uh, they're frustrated because they spent so much money with me. And I go from being kind of a sweet uh, orthodontist to being a private investigator. You know, well, have you been wearing your retainer? Why'd you stop? How come you didn't call us? And he said, it becomes almost adversarial and uh, it's really unpleasant. And so he said, look, you know, something like Retainer Club would really solve that problem. And so um, I thought, you know, this, look, I think this is a wonderful idea. And so I start kind of giving him some ideas. And he's like, look, you know, I, I've, been, I've had this idea for two years. I haven't done anything with it. What do you say we partner 50-50? And I was like, sold, let's do it. So, you know, going into business with one of your best friends, I think is, is either going to be uncharted the greatest. Uncharted waters. It's uncharted yeah. waters. You're, you're either, it's either going to be the greatest thing or like a catastrophe. Uh, so I can happily say, you know, over three years in now with Blair, it's really been just totally awesome. Uh, and uh, as I, as I've said before, you know, having a, a true partner, you know, just like I think in, in, a, in, a, in a good marriage, um, it, 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 it makes the highs higher and it makes the lows higher. Uh, you know, you're not alone. You've got someone to sort of share the burdens with and you've got someone to share the, the high moments too. So, uh, so we started off, I said, look, let's start beta testing with your patients. You know, that, that doesn't cost us anything. And <clears throat> excuse me, one, one year in, we discovered a couple of unbelievable things, you know, first of all, his patients loved it. Um, you know, he, we, you know, there's a couple of funny things and, and some of them probably, uh, some people don't want to admit, which is, you know, Blair, Blair, one of the things I love about Blair is his ability to be self-aware. And so he said, look, n none of my patients wants to come into my office. Like they don't really want to come here to see me. They don't want to, you know, take time out of their day or out of their school or work and drive. And even if it's a five minute appointment, it's not five minutes for them. They got to drive here. They got to park. They got to come in, you know, they got to wait. And so they really don't want to come see me for a retainer. 
right? Like post-treatment, it's such a simple thing. And, uh, you know, we learned that just telling his patients, no, 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 you don't need to come in. We've got your scan on file. We'll just send you a new one. They were just like, really? I don't have to come in? Like, like this is awesome. And so um, that was super reinforcing. So we had a bunch of, you know, we had over 150, you know, happy pain subscribers at the end of the first year. Uh, but then we learned something else that was even more kind of uh, remarkable, which was as Blair was letting his patients know about $99 retainers with Retainer Club, uh, half a dozen of his former patients who had stopped wearing their retainer, you know, five years ago, 10 years ago, uh, their teeth had moved and they needed new treatment. And so they became new, sort of new patients again, or new cases, which was a tremendous amount of new revenue for his, his practice. And I realized what a valuable kind of um, value proposition for a partner is that not only are we going to kind of get this, um, you know, sort of retainer business off your plate so you can focus all your time on treatment, you're going to get new patients out of this or new case starts out of this, not just from your existing you know, former patients, but also we're going to advertise and we're going to send people to you. Uh, hey, did you lose your retainer? You know, hey, dog eat your retainer. And when we send those people to your office to get scanned for five minutes, um, some of them are going to become new patients of yours. And so, um, so it's been a blast. It's been totally a lot of fun. Um, and I love kind of building a business uh, from the ground up. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's been great. And, and Mouthguard Club is fascinating because it's, it's on the one hand, very similar technology, but on the other hand, it's a completely different uh, product because, you know, retainer clubs for people who've had orthodontic treatment, Mouthguard Clubs for anybody who plays contact sports. And so you've got, you know, 40 million mouth guards sold in the U.S. every year. Um, you got all these people playing, you know, sports that require mouth guards like football and, and hockey and lacrosse, but you've also got, you know, plenty of people wearing them for basketball and soccer and, and other sports. And, and with the mouth guards, we can totally trick them out, you know, full customization, colors, logos, jersey numbers, anything people want. And, and kids in particular have a blast doing that. It's so much fun. And so uh, that's, been a, that's been a ton of fun too. Craig, amazing. You know, um, this journey that you've been on. Um, and, you know, I want to kind of wrap up with where we should point people towards. Um, and I know it's the, the front uh, of the interview we talked about, you know, obviously this is a technology that helps patients. It also helps grow dental offices and orthodontic offices, which is, you know, a win-win-win um, and keeping people's smiles and teeth in check, uh, hence in your face. So um, I'll mention, you know, people can go to retainerclub.com slash partner um, or mouthguardclub.com slash partner. Any other places we should point people online to check out? So, I mean, those are great. And, and so the, the partner sides of the, of those websites will, will tell orthodontists and dentists all about the benefits of being a partner. Of course, we've got the in your face podcast that, that they can download and check out where Blair and I are interviewing some of the, the leading, um, entrepreneurs and other people in the orthodontic and dentist space that are making a difference. Um, um, you know, we're, we're, we have partnerships now that are kind of cool because they're extending outside of, of orthodontists and dentists. We've got a, a partnership with the local uh, ice hockey rinks here in Arizona. Uh, we're we're uh, hopefully about to announce some partnerships with some hockey schools in the United States. And uh, so we're, we're, we're really trying to um, provide, uh, you know, dentists and orthodontists with a steady stream of people who are going to be showing up in their office to get a scan but probably need a dentist or probably need an orthodontist. And, you know, we think it's a real partnership. Our, our goal is to be the orthodontist or dentist's best friend. Um, we, we never want to compete with them. We don't move teeth. That's the job of the, of the dental professionals. Uh, we, we, we're, we're not a fan of the do-it-yourself uh, orthodontist out there. And so, you know, to me, it's a great partnership because we can help take care of you know, uh, a dentist or orthodontist patients, you know, post-treatment, you know, when they've, when they've already had their treatment and their teeth are already have been straightened. Um, but also get what is kind of a annoying aspect of their practice off their plate and, and replace that with, um, a much more lucrative aspect of their practice, which is new patients and new case starts. So, uh, I think it's a win-win 
I think it's a win-win-win because it's a win for their patients too, who get straight teeth for life and <clears throat> or better referral sources. I think it's a win for the practices and I think it's a win for us. Um, so I, I believe in that kind of win-win uh, philosophy generally. And so, um, and, and, and we're, we're doing some, we're trying to be really innovative. So one of the things we're excited about now, we have these great digital kiosks that we're putting into the uh, waiting rooms of our partner offices where adults and kids can kind of customize their mouth guards while they're waiting and then boom, they can get scanned five minutes later. You know, they're already there. So uh, people are really, you know, having a lot of fun with the kiosks. Um, so yeah, so, um, you know, we'll, we'll be at the, you know, AAO, the American Association of Orthodontists uh, conference every year. Um, and, um, and so, yeah, though they're, you know, and you can always, uh, yeah, just find us, uh, find us on the web. Awesome. Everyone check out the website, retainerclub.com. If you are a patient, uh, find an office near you or retainerclub.com slash partner or mouthguardclub.com slash partner. Craig, absolute pleasure. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Jeremy. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walked through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand.